take it away, Claudia. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, do you need my camera to be on or should I just turn it off? Is it distracting? Leave it on. I'll okay. keep it on. I'll keep mine Back. on. Awesome. Oh, okay. Have well, thanks. To talk to. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, first, thank you so much for the invitation. You know, um, it's always great to talk about what we're doing and exchange ideas and see what you guys are doing because that's uh, basically, I think, how we learn, right? Um, is this big exchange of ideas. And so um, just to give you a little bit of background, you can see the first slide here. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about preparedness because I talk about it in every single talk I give, right? Why? Um, because we need to be thinking ahead. We need to have things in order so that when that new disease comes in or that emergency comes in or that natural disaster or man-made disaster, whatever it may be, you're not, you know, you basically have the skill sets as well as the equipment and know-how, everything in place to manage those uh, problems so that you're protecting the health and safety of your citizens. Uh, hey, for everybody, Claudia, we are in... Claudia, I'm going to interrupt you, but I see your Teams window and not your PowerPoint presentation. Oh, ah, there we go. Here, hold on. Did it go? Uh, it's loading. Now I can see your slides. All Thanks. right, sorry. Okay, great. So this actually is a map of um, Orleans Parish. Uh, I don't know how many people have come, uh, gone to New Orleans. It's probably many usually. Um, but those little dots are all the locations that we have our um, surveillance traps out. And so we, we do weekly surveillance. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Whoops, I don't know what happened with the photo. It was there just a minute ago. Um, but anyway, this is our facility. Uh, we moved in in 2011 and, um, you know, we used to be in a different location, but with Hurricane Katrina, right, much of our, uh, many of our buildings were completely destroyed. So we're in a relatively new facility for those folks that have come visit our area. Just make sure you let me know and we will take give you a tour. So what do we do, right? So we do all of the mosquito control for Orleans Parish. So Orleans Parish is the same as uh, New Orleans and we also do road abatement. I've got crews on the ground right now. They're texting me as you were given the intro. They found a, an area with a bunch of runs that they're dealing with now. Uh, we also do the termite control and pest control for all city facilities, green space. Um, and then we also service a lot of historical trees. We have a very interesting staff, all kinds of different backgrounds, but we also do a lot of research industry supported. We do our own independent work, collaborative projects. We have a full molecular diagnostic laboratory. Um, and then again, Claudia, but I'm seeing the Teams window again. It kind of cut over to Teams just a couple what of seconds. What is going on? See, we do like best planning. Look, I'm pressing the button. Here it is. Not yeah. sure what happened there. If that happens again, just let me know. I'm not sure what happened, but um, yeah. All right, and then also uh, we also have government to government accounts. So we actually have termite uh, accounts that we service, just like a pest control company. And we fall under the umbrella of Homeland Security and Public Safety. All right, so that's where we fit. We've got um, aviation program, airboat, um, heavy equipment, all kinds of things like that. So that's uh, part of the reasons why we fit there, but it's a great place to be. So I know this is quite a diverse audience, right? And I think we always, we know, right? That there's a need for vector and urban pest control. Um, and it really, I think we need to think about it from an all hazard standpoint, right? So I think, you know, the big all hazards, of course, hurricanes, but think about uh, COVID and what happened with rodents, right? So that really is an all hazard situation. And fortunately, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that just having the systems in place allowed us to really do a lot, you know, immediately. Uh, but there is a need, obviously, disease transmission to human and animals, right? Including emergent diseases, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, displaced animals uh, and people, right? After uh, big disasters. So you guys don't get, imagine, a lot of hurricanes, but you know, when is that other earthquake going to happen? Or, you know, is there a windstorm, is there a flooding event, you know, things like that. And so people are out and about, they're more exposed to these pathogens and these vectors. So it's really important for us to have these things in place. 
Um, we know for a fact um, that you know mosquitoes definitely uh, interfere with recovery events. You can look at the state of Florida after hurricanes with huge numbers of floodwater mosquitoes. Us as well. I'm going to show you a photograph after Hurricane Ida last year. And then think about it with a Zika virus and that impact, right, of on tourism, on uh, travel. So there's a huge potential economic. You'd never want the CDC, right, to put that red box over your city or part of your city. And so that really has a big impact. For those that are not aware, um, so vector control, and this is mosquito and rodent abatement, is in the Stafford Act, right? So that is, uh, there is, it is eligible for public assistance after these disasters. So if you are not familiar, familiar with this, you know, I would really recommend that you read um, their policy just so you have the basics um, when there is a disaster, right? So then you know what the rules are and, and what kind of data you need to be uh, submitting. So for example, you need to submit your averages of your last three years. Do you have that in order? Where is it, right? Because they want it, they want it now. I'm actually you just have that request now that I actually need to complete. The other thing everyone should check on, and I don't know how it is for the state of California, is to make sure that pest control and vector control will fall under this is considered an essential service. This was huge right after COVID. There were states that people like us are, were sitting at home because they were not considered essential and they were not able to work, right? So fortunately in Louisiana, we were considered essential. We did not lose one day. So it was on, right? And it was really because of having this in place was is just unbelievable. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about disasters very briefly, but I'm going to talk about COVID and all this is going to play into how you basically manage, you know, a district, right? So you have to look at today, you need to look at next year, you need to look at five years, and you need to think about, you know, where do you want to leave your place that you work uh, when you retire? And so it is impossible with everybody's budgets to do everything at one time. But if you set your goals and you as a group, right, as an organization, have a game plan, a roadmap for where you want to go, then you're able to continuously work towards it and bring those resources into your organization. So when you think about Pests of concerns, it happens to be a hurricane, right? So or you can think about a really big wind event or water. Mosquitoes, they're very hot right now. So give it, you know, seven days from egg to adult. Uh, flies become a huge issue uh, when there's a breakdown in trash pickup. Rodents, not immediate, right? There's a lot of misunderstanding on this. Usually six to eight months after a disaster, you're going to start to see you know, rodent populations, but you will see wildlife and stray animals um, pretty quickly um, because they have been displaced. This happens to be last year. Um, you know, so we basically uh, started three days after Hurricane Ida. So fortunately in New Orleans, we didn't have the devastation that it would happen, occurred in central, south central Louisiana. Um, but we did have a lot of rain. The marshes were flooded and we have lots of water around us and high tides, of course. And these were some of our trap counts that were in the marsh. So even for uh, this is one trap night, by the way, incredible numbers. And so this is very common, especially if you, in Florida, when you see all these big events come through, all these floodwater mosquitoes hatch and they move, you know, long distances. So you need to be able to have the, the traps that you need. Uh, the know-how to do the identification, all of that, so that you can uh, really collect and make almost real-time decisions. So if anyone says, oh, it's not a big deal, you know, after a storm, that no one's going to get sick, no, that is not true. And so here's the paper, the publication, you can look it up. But after Hurricane Katrina, there was an increase, twofold actually, of West Nile cases in <laughs> Louisiana and um, southern Mississippi. So people are outside, they're cleaning up, you know, they're just more exposed uh, to these mosquitoes. And oftentimes it is for us, these storms are late summer, uh, really sort of peaking at the same time that you would see uh, West Nile peak or at least have it be very active in the region. 
The other thing all of you need to think about, right, when you're sort of managing or thinking about how your part you're doing in your district is like what's coming in, right? So again, you have to have folks at least paying attention to what's going on worldwide. Look, fortunately, we can travel again, right? So we spent two and a half years without travel, but we are back and you get in an airplane, my family's from Brazil. I went to Brazil this spring, right? So, or this summer, went. Let's say I'm out in the woods. They've got yellow fever. They, I've got a vaccine for that, but let's just say I didn't, you know, and I come home, not feeling very well, go to the doctor. They're not really sure what it is because they don't normally see this, but I've got the vectors in my backyard, right? So all of a sudden I'm sitting out there having dinner, getting bit by mosquitoes, 80s Egypti mosquitoes happen to be viremic. And next thing you know, it's in our local population, right? This is really sort of that whole Zika concept. And we did not, as, as far as anyone detected, have local Zika transmission, but we have everything in place. So certain things needed to happen, which you know we don't have enough time here for this talk, but those are the things that you need to start thinking about for when you do it. And so, again, you know, we just talked about this, right? Do you have a surveillance program that's going to look for Aedes aegypti if you have them in your region? Aedes albopictus, I know for sure you do. Um, and then it could be even a Culex or whatever, you know, pathogen is coming in. Uh, but you really need to understand what's going on. You have to have the uh, infrastructure in the response capacity. You know, do you have two people that work for your program? You guys are a big city, right? Is it a contractor that does the work? Do they have good bid specifications for what needs to happen? Um, you know, what is what is it? You know, is it the health folks are going to transfer over to do mosquito control? Every kind of variation has happened. We have to have good public education and outreach. I'll be honest with you, it is a very difficult thing to incite behavior change, but we must try, right? And then continue to do the education as we are doing today. So I, I appreciate the invite. And we attend things as well, right? To learn new techniques, what is working and have that interagency cooperation. I think what happened with Zika virus, and I, I'm saying all these things, I want you to think about it locally. We, it really forced the communication between uh, di uh, departments and the state agencies, which was great. So those relationships have already been built so that if something else comes in, it's already there. So we're going to be toggling back and forth with mosquitoes and rodents, but sort of the same concepts, right? So think about it even with rodent control. So we've had a rodent control program uh, probably for 60, 70 years here at the city of New Orleans. It's a really long, our department started in 1964 with mosquitoes only, and they already had a rodent control program at that time, but it was embedded in the health department. All right, it wasn't until the early 90s that it went from the health department into um, mosquito control. So we're mosquito rodent, and then also in the 90s um, have added termite as well. And so like every city, and I know you are the same, um, you know, we were having rodent issues in a lot of locations. And when people went away and the food source went away and um, everyone is at home, these rats became very hungry and they started to move into the streets so you know it's you have to have that capacity ready to move so what are zoonotic diseases right because we think about it we don't have a lot of human cases overall if you compare it to other countries right if you take brazil or other places if there is a big flooding event in rio de janeiro well guess what there are a lot of people that are going to die of leptospirosis it's going to happen we don't necessarily see that in the US. There are cases, right? You have had cases of murine typhus in California, all right, in LA, in some of those areas. Uh, murine typhus is occurring in Texas as well. And so, you know, what is a zoonotic disease, right? There are infections that are shared between animals and people. So again, today we're gonna primarily be talking about mosquitoes and rodents, but there are a whole lot of other animals, all right, that can transmit diseases to people, which I know you deal with. Mosquitoes and flies, we don't have a lot of tick issues here, uh, but we do have Chagas disease um, in our population. Fleas and mites, we have oriental rat flea in parts of the city, we have lots of mites as well. So for us, rats, mice, uh, we do have raccoons, we know they have 
Bayless ascaris, and we have bats as well. When you think about mosquito-borne diseases, there are many out there. The number one issue now is, um, is West Nile virus for us. That is what it is. We are having a very active uh, season in our state. Uh, we've only had one positive pool. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I do think it's about some of the things that we are doing that are keeping those uh, numbers down. But you have to, again, be aware of what is potentially next because you too have some of these vectors. When it comes to rodents, you can go to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We don't have loss of virus here in the U.S., but there are so many different types of uh, pathogens that are there. Um, but we do need to keep an eye on things. Um, and, you know, are you doing surveillance? Is somebody else doing surveillance? Are you cooperating? You know, what is going on? But there's also, to complicate factors, the indirect spread, either with a tick or a fly, sand flies, snails as well. Um, actually, so totally interesting, we have apple snails that have just moved through Louisiana. I'm trying to figure out if they are one of the, you know, parts of the cycle for a lungworm as well for, um, with rodents. So lots of issues. All right, so now when you're thinking about your mosquito control program or your rodent control, if you have it vector, whatever it may be, you're going to have to at least think about if there's an issue or even on a daily response, right? On your regular operation, do you have a plan, right? If it's a you're responding to an emergency, do you have a response plan? During Zika, we started one prior you know, to the summer, but we really started outlining in that January and February of what do we need to be doing, all right? When what's lacking, what's missing, what do we need to go get in order to fill in the gaps? So surveillance is key, especially with the mosquito control program, um, you know, collecting the mosquitoes, doing viral testing, understanding the resistance intolerance of your insecticides. If you're using insecticides and you don't even know if it works at killing your mosquitoes, you're not going to succeed. So surveillance testing is a huge part of it. Having the infrastructure and the equipment, right? Lar for larviciding, adulticiding. Uh, we're in the process of purchasing a helicopter, okay, to replace our, our airplane. So that's going to allow for additional flexibility in larviciding as well as adulticiding. Are your, um, is your staff trained with the equipment, right? So sometimes there's turnover or uh, somebody leaves for whatever reason, you know, are you stuck or do other people, do you have redundancy so that people know how to use this equipment? And then contingency contracts are really important, especially for folks that don't have programs or need to supplement their program, right? So I'm in the process right now of writing the specs for a contingency contract for aerial adult setting. It is a good thing to have. Right? Uh, we have hurricanes. It's relatively, unfortunately, common. Um, so, you know, those things need to be in place if you need a little extra. Talk to your other agencies, as we talked about it before, and make sure that you're educating not only ourselves, our public, but our government officials, right? On how important the different things that we do and how it relates to the well being and safety of our citizens. Okay? Very important. It's very easy to cut programs when there are no very little disease. Ah, why do we need to fund it if there's, you know, not much disease? No, 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 no. We need to keep it rolling because that's our, our alarm system, right? And I will tell you at the city of New Orleans, our administrators understand that very well. Okay. Very, very important. All right. Anything we do, right, is going to be in an integrated pest management sort of scheme, right, or at least using this um, sort of policy. Immediately after a hurricane or some giant disaster, it's a very difficult, right, to do IPM, but you're really going to be relying more on that surveillance and on that insecticides. Um, your rules are a little bit different. I mean, I think we Louisiana and California, you have more restrictions on some of the pesticides and applications than we do. But regardless, you know, it's really going to be focusing on that. Um, but, you know, do you have biological control? Are there other things that you can be doing um, as it settles down a bit that you start getting back into your regular sort of operations? And it's really also with rodents as well, right? 
you know, working on that public education and do you have the infrastructure, do you tap into your city to push out information to your residents, for example? Uh, do you have that cooperation already? So um, it was a holiday, just to give you an idea on that, we had a holiday season that, you know, obviously the weekend um, with 4th of July. So we ended up sending a press release out just as a reminder for our citizens to wear repellent, turn over containers because we're getting a lot of rain. But then we also ask our health department to tweet it out for us and, you know, work into these other uh, agencies to increase the amount of people that are seeing the message. So it's really important on that education. Road inspections and surveillance. Woo, that's hard. So surveillance is tough, right? Who's really doing a surveillance, true surveillance program for rodents? I'm not sure. I know there's lots of inspections that happen. We are currently walking down that path right, of creating a true surveillance program for rodents. That's going to be a five to seven year project because it's a very complex. Sanitation, more sanitation and more sanitation. Super important when it comes to rodent exclusion and all that. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. Surveys are really important. OK, so surveys are one time gathering of uh, inspection data to assess the situation. It is very expensive, especially with rodent control to do let's say trapping on a regular basis across an entire city, right? So we've had projects in the past with Tulane University where that has happened and it is very expensive, <coughs> lots of people. Um, so we don't always have those resources, but we do have resources to do surveys. <coughs> and so I think those are very important. But what we want to do, especially when it comes to mosquito control, is have the ability of doing surveillance. And so what that's gonna do is a continual process, right? Of monitoring the situation and we can go back years and look at our data. So when you're thinking about managing a program, think of your data. How do you have your data? We had to do a lot of work on getting all of our data uniform and cleaned up. Um, so now we can go back years and look at what's happening with West Nile or a particular mosquito of interest. All of that is there. And it's also very important so that you can see if your control measures are working, right? if they're being effective. So we use that very, very much to um, to look at effectiveness of our programs. So this is what I showed you already. These are the different locations, right, that we have trap sites throughout New Orleans. And <laughs> I wish there was a trap that worked for every mosquito, but that is not the case. So we often use a variety of different types of traps uh, to identify our mosquitoes. And we also have a really good surveillance arbol virus in Louisiana. We might have to put that chicken for six dollars. And um, so what happens is the state of Louisiana is a very good surveillance program. Our different districts put out their traps on Monday. They collect the mosquitoes and identify them. By Wednesday morning, they're going to LSU vet school, the diagnostic lab, the arbovirus diagnostic lab at, at the vet school. And by Friday, they're telling us if we if that pool of mosquitoes has triple E or SLE or West Nile virus. So most of our state has moved away from sentinel chickens and we're using mosquito pools, all right, for um, our surveillance system. It's much more of a real time uh, situation. And frankly, from a time and standpoint, it's a lot easier as well. Think about your source reduction, right? Really important. So we deal with this kind of situation all the time. Waste tires are a big issue here in New Orleans. Illegal dumping is a big issue. And then even working with our residents to, you know, we it rains every day, but so many pots and have saucers under them and they're breeding mosquitoes or people are busy and they just have stuff in their yard that a tarp or whatever it is that may be uh, accumulating that water. So we need to sort of get everybody in the groove of turning over containers. And so these are a little bit older numbers, but you can gives you sort of an idea of the number of tires that are removed through the city. We've also looked at the sort of profile of mosquitoes throughout uh, parts of the year. Um, so it gives us a better idea of what we're dealing with when, okay, and sort of what that risk is. And so Actually, this paper is out for publication, um, but 
you know, we did a really, we looked at the 311 data. I believe the city of San Francisco has a 311 system. Yes? I think so. Yeah, at least where your residents can call in and, and report. So we looked at that data as well as, you know, boots on the ground data from the sanitation department, from our information, because we are, um, we have the permits through our Louisiana DEQ to pick up and dispose of tires. So that's something, again, part of that infrastructure that you're thinking about. Well, I see a tire, let me just pick it up and, and deal with it, right? Instead of letting it sit there breeding mosquitoes or treat it and have to go back the following week. We try to really address the issues. But what we found is around the periphery of the city, there were huge piles, but there were a lot of little piles, you know, within sort of the urban centers of the city. So that really helped us, you know, create some educational programs of how to dispose of, of, of tires because the city will pick it up at the, you know, with their trash pickup, for example. So those are little things. Um, you know, the use of insecticides are, are really very important, okay? So it is really the last resort. We're very conservative about when we use a pesticide, period, across the board. We want to fix those um, issues first, if we possibly can. But, you know, the reality here is that a ULV treatment is going to give you that quick knockdown, right? So let's say it's a Friday and... Um, we're getting the results back from our, our testing. We know those mosquitoes were collected on Monday and Tuesday, and we have a positive pool. Uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. And so that uh, usually an application is going to happen. We have to look at where it is, what parts of the city. Do we do a larvicide? Do we do adulticide? All this, we look at weather. Um, do we, we always do announcements to uh, sort of empower our public to be aware and be transparent of the situation, but it, is it going to be ground? Is it going to be aerial? Lots of different factors go into place. You have to make sure that timing is done correctly. You know, if we're targeting our southern house mosquito, it's going to be late at night. It's not going to, we never spray during the day. Um, make sure that your equipment is calibrated properly, right? Good product stewardship is key here um, to doing good applications. There are the options of doing residual treatments. We don't do them very often. Most of those are done with pyrethroids. We actually are looking at resistance testing. We've been doing it for years and years, but we've been doing it on a very large scale. We know that our Aedes albopictus and our Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are quite susceptible. We have a couple little pockets, very small in the city, with some issues with Aedes aegypti, but for the most part, they're very susceptible. On the other hand, our southern house mosquito is very tolerant or resistant to pyrethroids, and we don't use very many pyrethroids, right? So is it coming from, you know, over-the-counter products? Is it coming from the professional market? We're trying to tease that apart now. The other thing is, um, so, and usually those are going to be those residual treatments, right, that are, people are using, but not only for mosquitoes, but for ants and other cockroaches, right? Those are most of those over-the-counter professional market uh, products. Um, <laughs> we also larvicide, and we actually, uh, it's been a year, almost two years, that now we do it on a large scale, area-wide larviciding in some cases with equipment. And that's relatively new, right? That was a goal we wanted to have. And we saw that what happened in Miami is that alternating or chasing an adulticide treatment with a larvicide treatment that was very important for breaking transmission of Zika virus in mosquitoes. So we're like, we need to have that, right? And so again, setting those goals, trying to find the funding and setting those priorities to be able to have that in place. And so now we do. And so one of the things we're doing this year is we had big swaths of the city that we um, really, I think until a week or two ago, we did no adulticide treatments. It was all larvicide treatments. And we were comparing it to other parts of the city where we were doing adulticide treatments and some larvicide in between, right? So how do you how do you do this? Does it also, you know, break transmission of West Nile virus? So we're still teasing those results apart, but those are the kind of priorities after we were able to get it operationally with the equipment, then you start to tweak and say, okay, how do we improve on this, you know, year by year? So these are annual goals that we set towards the end of the year, you know, so that we can gear up for the following year to answer our questions. 
And so, again, when you're doing adulticide treatments, and I know in some areas it is a challenge uh, for some of your locations, um, but it's important, right, in some of these cases, uh, especially when you're having uh, virus activity, but you have to time it with the mosquito. Um, you may have to do, in the case of a disease intervention, you may have to do multiple applications. I just talked about the McAllister et al. That's the publication from Miami with the ULV and larvicide area-wide, it's very important. And you have to make sure that you're actually testing these applications in your areas, okay? So we've done big trials with cage trials, looking at will this application get into the vegetation or below the vegetation so that it's killing those mosquitoes. So those are all things that are very important. We talked a little bit about ground larviciding, and this is, has been a big game changer for us. It is not cheap to larvicide on an area-wide basis, right? It's very expensive, actually. So we've even been playing around with the rate, uh, but what, you know, of, of the products that are out there. But we've evaluated with the use of a helicopter, and you can see in the second picture that actually the, the formulation there looks a little red. Well, why did we do that? Because we were doing it in big fields, looking at um, the application, the droplets, to see if they would fall where we wanted it to fall, right, um, on cards. But then we also did the bioassays to confirm mortality. We've got these three uh, pieces of equipment, the Ag Mr. LV-8, we've got the Buffalo Turbine, and um, to be honest, the one that we prefer in many cases is the A1 Mr. So a lot of flexibility there in uh, getting the product to the location. Resistance testing is key. If your uh, folks are not doing that, we need to really get you in the ballpark here to be able to do resistant testing. If it might be bottle bioassays, it may be, may be molecular you know, tools that are out there, but we need to make sure that our larvicides and adulticides are actually killing the mosquitoes. Here are just some examples. This is uh, Dr. Catone in the lab here um, and some of our folks and from our office, but you can see they're setting up some bottle bioassays. Um, <laughs> you can visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They've got all of that online. You may already do it, but that's something, you know, it takes a little tweaking to get it, but once you're there, you do need to have a little um, rearing capacity, um, but that's a very good standardized tool to look at resistance. Uh, we've got also, uh, now we're doing uh, KDR, you know, the knockdown, uh, looking at the alleles to see what our profile in our uh, populations of mosquitoes are. So that's a, you know, pretty quick. It may not necessarily, you know, translate into uh, they're not dying at all, you know, out in the field, but it gives you an idea if you've got those genes floating around in, the, in your mosquito uh, profile, I guess that you your population. So it get, at least it gets you a starting point. And so this is what I was talking about before. The state is a few years old, but um, we really only had a couple of areas in New Orleans where we started to see uh, more resistance, okay? Uh, for the most part, it looked pretty darn good through the city and most of our Aedes aegypti are very susceptible to pyrethroids. All right, and then we're gonna talk a little bit too about education, uh, biological control. I didn't talk about it so much here today, but one of the things we've been working on is the use of copepods for uh, mosquito, control, mosquito control. And so again, are we going to be releasing copepods through the entire city? No, not likely gonna happen, but are we going to be using it on a larger scale in select areas? Well, we have been actually evaluating that. So we're actually doing, we started with the lab. For all of you um, that may not know, the city of New Orleans years ago did a lot of work with copepods and then, um, but never really got into the large scale. So again, setting goals of like, yep, let's figure out if we can actually do this. And so lab trials have been going on for the last several years. And now we're actually at field trial a large scale, larger scale um, application. So we'll see what happens. I'll have more data on that in, towards the end of the year next year. Let's talk a little bit about public education. Make sure that you guys um, have that in place. And also think about your communications department. Are they schooled on the importance of mosquito control or rodent control? Are you sending out reminders and press releases to your public? 
We send them out on a regular basis. You can actually go visit the city of New Orleans, uh, NOLA.gov, and they post all of the press releases there. You can see that we actually um, do it on a regular basis. We just did one on Friday. Just as a reminder, pay public. Don't forget, turn over your containers. It's been raining and look, we're all outside. So don't forget to wear your repellent. OK, it's West Nile season going on. So very important to do that and also coordinate with your state agencies so that everybody is saying the same message. Because if you're saying one thing and they're saying another thing and the federal government saying another thing, it, it does not build good trust. We want everybody aligned. So building those relationships are very important. But the main thing here, what does our public do? You know, we want them to do is turn over your containers, right? If you do that, it's going to help us a lot and not have to use a lot of pesticides. I mean, it, they really can do their part. So I'm the director of the department, right? And I, I'm for those that I think most of you don't know me, but I'm pretty high energy and I am always thinking 10 steps ahead, right? So who am I talking to? Who's my audience? What do they think? Do they know, you know, anything about vector control? So this is what our audience looks like. It's big. It's not only the residents, it's the industry, it's the state folks, it's our employees, making sure that our employees are all on the same page, right? It's the mayor, it's the city council, it's the media, use the media. I know you have to you're at work for a city, so you're gonna have the same channels as I do, right? But maybe if there's something going on, see if they'll set up a press conference to talk about it, right? You can make all these things educational. Um, you know, mayors change. It's just the way it is. And so <laughs> their staff changes. Communications department people change. And so for a lot of people, it's very scary to talk about rodents. OK, ah, maybe we shouldn't talk. No, no, no. Let's talk about it because you can always take a story and turn it into an educational piece. And that's what we want to do. So now we're constantly being asked for um interviews or whatever it is and they're always great about saying yeah please do it because it's just another avenue to push out information right we also work with uh, universities and also international audiences as well right so there's a lot of different folks now what's complicated these days right is that our profile of our residents are very different um Fortunately, we're sort of back in person. I don't know where you guys are um, with all the COVID, but we're getting there, right? And so we're back now in the last couple of months with kids being back in our building or us going to see kids. So, you know, we're working towards the future there uh, on that. We also uh, teach the professional market. So our pest management professionals, our state sanitarians, our environmental health workers, because that's just more boots on the ground. We're teaching them what we know so that they're able to do their job a little better and help us. We have a whole segment of the population that will never pick up a smartphone, okay? They like their newspapers. They like the traditional ways of getting information. And on the other hand, you have folks that only look at social media. And so you need to have some sort of presence nowadays. And you deal with this as well, is that there will be a whole segment of the population that doesn't want you to use any pesticides, no matter what the consequences, right? As it relates even to public health. So it's very important that you get your administrators, you know, really schooled on these topics because there are, it's all about risk analysis, right? And there are times that we need to protect the health of our citizens, and that is going to entail the use of pesticides. All right, so the other thing is we've been trying to get creative here with our outreach. Um, this happens to be a bookmark, you know, that we put in libraries. People love these. And so we've got one on rodents, but I've got one on mosquitoes and termites as well, and we'll be expanding. They're cheap to make. And I'm telling you, people love them, okay? So it's something that they're not gonna pick up because my thing, and I had this conversation today with a printer, you know, prior to this meeting, because I'm printing some stuff about dumpsters and dumpster management is, you know, if you just take a piece of paper, I think people just throw it away, right? But if it's something cute, so like a card stock, something that they may wanna keep, right? To put in a book or whatever, hopefully they'll look at it more than once to try to get this message across. 
but we do brochures, of course. We do lots of social media now, and that really started uh, two years and a few months ago, and it's picking up steam, which has been great. We've been working with the pest control industry for years and years. Webinars have been a big thing, and really COVID pushed that pushed it there, and that's growing our audience as well. And then we tap into other agencies like NOLA Ready. So NOLA Ready has almost 95,000 people, right, that would receive a text message. So for storm prep, for example, or if there is a, um, a flooding event, let's say we have a heavy rain, for example, they'll send out a message. So if we need to tap into them, we can as well. Our neighborhood engagement folks have huge audiences, right? Um, they're on Nextdoor and other platforms that they're able to push out some of our information as well. So look, we're little in the grand scheme of things, but it's really about using the resources that are around you to tap into it. But you really have to you know, educate the other folks on how important vector control is. So for those, we're at NOLA Mosquito, all right? And so these are just some of the things that we've created. Uh, we use a, uh, just an easy, cheap online program <laughs> to create these. I've done a lot of these myself, right? I'm not super creative, but I think they look nice. And then we've got an education, education coordinator as well. So, you know, it's just the different topics. Sometimes it's very simplistic. Please don't feed your animals outside. Leave the, at least leave it unattended, right? Just let's get that message across. And it, it's shocking, but it's okay. A lot of people don't necessarily put two and two together. Maybe they just don't think about it, but we need to tell them. Many of these have been printed on cardstock, sort of like three by three little cards. And we leave them at the library. We take them to the little shows. And so people like to see those. We talked about this already. So this is a little bit of an older picture, but you know, we do a lot of training of the professionals, local and then from other states as well. So it's just more boots on the ground. Um, and it also, I think, really helps facilitate those partnerships between public and pr uh, private industry. We're all on the same team, okay? So it seems like calling a, um, you know, a health inspector is a scary thing from, let's say a pest control company calls a health inspector. No, it's not. It's okay, we're all on the same team, right? We all want safe food. We all want pest-free uh, establishments. That's what's going on. And again, I talked to you a little bit about this. This is our current mayor, uh, um, uh, Mayor Cantrell. This is our previous mayor, uh, Mayor Landrew. But, you know, really teaching and explaining, right? You know, what what is important about vector control? You know, they have been incredible supporters of our program and really understand those priorities. And a lot of times it starts at the top and goes down. So very, very important. This was our, one of my former supervisors, Director of Homeland Security in New Orleans. But, you know, it's very important. And you can see this is actually Zika. Here I am hidden in the back, okay? <laughs> but you know, it's okay. We were doing, um, we got the message to our, our previous mayor saying, look, I think you need to do a press conference. Let's go ahead and educate everybody on Zika virus. And lo and behold, there were three over that season. So just to give you an idea how important, you know, and one of them was very early on. You got health department, state health department, CAO, code enforcement, you know, city council at the time. So really got all those folks together. So here's another thing, sort of using your social media accounts. I'm assuming you guys have them, right? This is after uh, Hurricane Ida. Um, there was already, because of COVID and some other issues, there's some of the areas already having uh, a breakdown in trash collection. It was sort of slow pickup. And so add in a hurricane with no power for a long time. You know, we were looking at in some places 60 days or so without trash pickup. So you know, what do you do? And we had done so much work already with COVID and the rats had, you know, populations have gone down. So I didn't want it to come up. So one of the messaging really was using 10% bleach solution inside your bags uh, before you put it out. There aren't a lot of repellents out there that work for rodents, uh, but 10% bleach, you know, deters them pretty well. And so it's just something that we could engage our audience, you know, which is a residence, you know, to help out and do their part while we're working and doing it as well on a larger scale. 
when you're thinking about your education, you're going to have to think about your different audiences, right? So some will be for your pest professionals, some will be for your health providers. You know, you're going to have to think about all these things in advance because it gets very difficult during an emergency. Um, but these are things that you can set goals for uh, to get them ready. Because once you have something in place, it's a lot easier to modify it or edit it as needed instead of coming up with something, you know, from uh, brand new when you have 30 requests um, all going into your email. OK, so and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm just telling you, there's plenty of stuff out there. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a great option to start um, or get with other agencies that you may know of and say, hey, what do you have right uh, that you could share? All right, so when it comes to rodent control, right? So we've had a rodent control program in our agency for a while, which is really good. So not a big program as far as number of employees, but all of our staff is cross-trained. So let's say we're at like 40 people right now. Everybody in my group, even office staff, if needed, can go to the field to do rodent work or mosquito control work or whatever. We're licensed, just like a pest control company, uh, but I think it's really important for everybody to be licensed because you have to sometimes pivot, right? We do not have one person that says, this is my job, this is all I do, and that's it. We do not do that. It is, of course, you work through like their job descriptions and all that through civil service, but if it's vector control or pest control, you can do anything, all right? So I'm just letting you know from a little agency, we can do a lot because we're able to really shift resources that way. So when you think about it, again, here's a picture of New Orleans, Superdome, Smoothie uh, Center here, basketball, very urban center as well. Not a huge city like yours, right? But still big enough. And so think about these different components, again, as an IPM approach. In the case of an epidemic, let's say a mosquito-borne disease comes in, all right? And we're dealing with it. If the public, for example, does not turn over their containers or whatever it may be, we've got the technology and the know-how to put that larva aside in those containers in the back. We know, we've already done the trials, okay? When it comes to rodents, it's a whole nother story. We really need everybody's participation because it would be our group going in, removing those trash sources or whatever it may be. So it's a lot more challenging on an area-wide situation. So that's why it's so important uh, for that sanitation component. Now there's some basic information that I think everybody needs for any kind of rodent control program. Do you know the rodent species in your area? I know you have a lot of roof rats, okay? But do you know where they are and how it all fits in? Has anyone done a survey? All right. Funding is not great. Usually across, there's a couple papers out there, you know, that show that mm, rodent control is kind of a mess when it comes to municipalities. You know, it's either nothing, a little bit. Um, there are some well-funded, but people do different things. So it's 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 all over the place. Um, you guys have a 311 system, assuming there's a place where they can call in for rodent sighting or rodent complaints of some sort. Uh, you have to do some sort of periodic survey or surveillance, right? Um, Interagency cooperation information sharing, super critical when it comes to rodent control. What's going on in safety and permits and your code enforcement and your sanitation rangers. There's a lot of communication here in, in New Orleans, which is really good. Your state folks, right? So a lot of communications, understanding your infrastructure. We're an old city, so sewers, all that kind of stuff, what's going on underground. What's your private industry capacity? Do you know? Do you know who, like, do you have a list of companies? Do you know them at all? Because if something happens on a big scale, you may need to use them as a private contractor. So it's already good to know who's out there. What tools do you have available, right? Situation in California has been a bit of a challenge with some of your tools, right? But you do have carbon dioxide, which is something that we've been using, non-active baits, pest proofing capacity. We do tons of pest proofing, um, you know, and trapping as well. We do lots of snap traps, we do, uh, which is part of our, our general thing public awareness, and then of course, what's really challenging is participation of the public, right? We want our public to do a little better. Here's a two publications, this is from Nature, if you're interested, and this one's a relatively new paper, 
from the group out in Vancouver. There's another paper that came out, I think, after this already, or it's in press, something like that. But it gives you a very good idea of what is going on in different districts, right? That's Lee. We were interviewed here as well, and then NATO sort of took a, a broader, you know, sort of picture of what's going on in rodent control. So these are some of your issues as well. I'm assuming some parts of California. I have a colleague. I think you guys know her, Neve Quinn. Um, you know, it is roof rat country up there. All right, and I've also met with the folks uh, up at the private district, uh, public district. I'm forgetting their name right now. I'm sorry, but. Um, you know, Norway, we have Norway rats, roof rats, and the house mouse. Those are our big three commensals, right? They are the commensals, but that is what we deal with. But we really deal from our operation standpoint, we deal with Norways and roof rats. And if I had to pick a rat that I wanted to, you know, deal with, it would be Norway. Way easier than dealing with, with uh, roof rats, okay? And so, why are rodents such good um, agents, right, to transmit disease to humans? Well, one, there's, we don't have 2,000 species here in the US, but there are many species throughout the world, but they're very opportunistic and they have a very high reproduction potential as well. Our population densities can be very high um, in some areas and they're paradomestic, right? They're in and around our structures. So we provide everything they need to survive. We need to do better, right? On our education to cut that water, put that food away, but don't stop feeding the birds, okay? So those are the little things uh, that cause. And so when you think about it from an urban rodent standpoint, these are like my big things, right? Contamination of food, as you, very, you know, lots of parts of your city have lots of tourists like we do. Food safety. Think about that rat that's in that sewer that's now behind those cups and that ice maker getting whatever on them. Most people might go to a restaurant, let's say they don't feel good, like, oh, I think I got food poisoning. I don't feel that great. I'm thinking like, oh my God, do you have a rodent borne disease and you just don't know it, right? What is it? So that's how I think. And so I think everybody should be thinking about that. And so Destruction and damage to property, yes, they cause, you know, gnawing uh, wires cause fires. Disease transmission, not a lot of cases. However, I will tell you, and I'm going to show you, our pathog our rats are loaded, okay, with pathogens. They are loaded. So again, a lot of these symptoms that you would have from a rodent-borne pathogen are very nondescript. Maybe you're having flu-like symptoms, go to the doctor, they put you on antibiotics, you're like, oh, you're fine. All right, but maybe you had something. Asthma cases in schools and also in buildings, big issue. And it just doesn't look good for cities. Do you, I don't want anybody coming to New Orleans, going to a restaurant and a rat runs across the floor and that's what they're gonna talk about. They're not gonna talk about the World War II Museum and how awesome it is or how delicious the food is. They're gonna talk about the rats, okay? When you think about Manhattan, what do all of you think about? Is it the Empire State Building? I love it, beautiful, love Manhattan. That's not what I think about, okay? I think about rats and what a mess the trash is. Okay, that's what I think about. Now, I don't want anybody thinking about that. So anyway, all right, so we talked, well, we're gonna talk about this very briefly. So <laughs> direct contact, right? Indirect, vector-borne, food-borne, they're great. It, different avenues of transmitting pathogens to us. And again, after a natural disaster, even an earthquake, right? You're not going to see rats immediately. They may be some displaced, but let's say they do die. It's going to take some time for them to rebuild populations. We have seen that clearly in Katrina. There's literature out there with, that show that after flooding events, but it's really important that you have these things in place. So a little bit old here slide, but um, there's a big project with Tulane University. The areas in yellow are areas that were uh, trapping occurred, but it gives us a very, and this happened for four years, right? So a very good, twice a year, very good idea of where our, our rodents are and what species. So we have parts of the city that are, they're like uh, Riverside. I mean, it is seriously uh, roof rats, okay? But other parts of the city, it is really mixed. And the French Quarter is down here. 
Um, I don't know if my little pointer is showing or not, but it's primarily uh, Noirette's there in these commercial areas. But what happened when these students were looking is that, oh, let's look at the pathogens as well. Boom, you look, you find. All right, so here's Bartonella. It's not going to kill anybody, all right, but it can, it can make you pretty sick, flu-like symptoms, but you don't want anything. But they're there. You can see the little red dots. Let's look at Leptospira, all right? Not good, again all over the place, um, you know, throughout these uh, animals that were trapped. So we find primarily mites on our animals. We actually find that our animals are pretty clean. They look pretty healthy most of the time where they don't look great, unfortunately, are in our homeless encampments. They look rough, okay? And I don't know if there's just more competition going on, all of that, but really mites are the big um, ectoparasite for us. Uh, the next one would be like in parts of the city, we find a Chiopis, so Oriental rat flea, uh, very few lice. We, I think, have maybe seen one tick all this time. So, um, but that's really of concern here with the Chiopis, right, uh, in some of those animals. We can talk about this. You're going to get the, the presentation here, but there's a lot of reasons why we would get some sort of, you know, pest issues uh, with that. So I think that if you have limited resources, right, in your program, but you are getting the calls in, you really do need to look at what profile and where they're coming in from. We do have a lot of repeat callers. They just want us to go out, so you'll have to diagnose that. But you may find areas that you have clustering of calls. That you, that's maybe your area that you're going to focus on and figure out what is going on, right? So that's important. Uh, when it comes to looking at uh, vector-borne or, or just different diseases, um, we're working towards being able to do this on a regular basis. We're in our laboratory. I told you we have a full molecular lab. We're getting our laboratory with BSL2 plus status so that we can bring in some of these controls that are needed to evaluate our samples, okay? But I want to be able to do those kinds of things in-house um, instead of farming it out and sending it off for a fee. But for the most part, you may have to partner with a, a university or, you know, bring in the expertise. There are folks uh, in California, I know near Riverside uh, Agency, public agent, Orange, Orange County, I think, um, that does do this work. Um, so I think that would be a great example. Don't forget about mirroring typhus. That was a huge issue. And I think, I don't know if it still continues to be a problem, but it's been in New Orleans historically. We have not had cases uh, in uh, recently, but we are looking at it. And so actually it's super interesting. You can find the paper down here if you're interested to read it. It's from a long time ago, but they were actually doing surveillance at that time, right? Where are those programs? <laughs> Money has evaporated and they are no more, which is not good. Um, but it really, you know, those programs at the time really helped solidify the rodent control program at the city because they really were able to show the results, get the human cases and urine typhus to zero. They added a lot more funding to the rodent control program at that time. So basically with expansion of that program. So pretty interesting. They were finding observations of 100 rats per hour. Holy cow. Like we don't see that, right? But at the time, you know, we have railroads that would bring in, at the time they had rail, well, the railroads are still there but those are all active docks with lots of food and all kinds of things. So you have to look at things a little bit historically. Mirroring typhus, of course, is a big issue. Told you we're building that capacity in-house. These are some rats that we collected during COVID time. Um, it's important. Guys, I can't even tell you how, and you know this already, sanitation is such a huge issue and it is really a challenge, right? Is getting that trash cleaned up, especially when it comes to rodents. But if things sit out there for a long time for mosquitoes, all of this will accumulate, accumulate water. Where having that larvicide capacity is good, really good. And honestly, it's a much greener profile to be able to use these larvicides. They're a lot more target specific, which is good. We have to get rid of this, right? You can have a building that's nice and clean inside, but if you're dealing with this, it's going to sustain those populations. And so dealing with our health department, with our rangers, we're actually moving towards enforcement. I have to do some work. I've been out of town for a while, but I have to finish our training module. And then four of us at the department will be able to write citations as well. This is what we're going to get reprinted. 
Um, so they're dumpster guidelines. I think a lot of times in our stores and our facilities, they don't really know what those guidelines are. And so just throw that back there. I'm not even going to close that dumpster door. Who cares? Well, you should care because it makes all the difference. And so really getting it out to that proper dumpster management is rodent prevention. That is bottom line. And so if you work in this field, we need to get this out. If you're interested, you know, I'm happy to share whatever we have. I know you deal with this on a larger scale. Our homeless encampments, um, we do not use rodenticides in those encampments. We use pest proofing, which is essentially concrete. We use rat ice, uh, but also Leafatech is um, getting the tanks. Actually, I think you guys already have it for the tanks of CO2. You have to be a pesticide applicator here uh, in our state, I believe with you as well. So to be very careful about some of these issues uh, in encampments, I know that you are. And so we can talk more about it in the question and answer. I'm going to keep rolling because I'm almost an hour talking. But trapping and rodenticides, you're facing a whole nother challenge with rodenticides, okay? But look, trapping is very effective. Um, we don't use a lot of cage traps for day-to-day -day trapping. That's more for sample collection and all of that. But trapping and using pre-baiting and really good, smart placement, it really can knock down your populations. This was after COVID. You can see this is Bourbon Street. Nobody was there. We actually, in the past, after Hurricane Katrina, baited like zip codes with storm uh, with rodenticides and storm drains. It worked very well for about a 60-day period, but it did not work well during COVID. So that did not happen. And we ended up um, using bait stations in strategic locations and really knocking down those populations. This is what I was talking about, but that just did not work for us. And again, we just don't put our product out and just say, hey, I hope for the best, right? We're really very professional and we look at consumption and we look at what areas are active. And if you don't need the stations, we remove them. We're done, right? Uh, but if they need it, do it. Good records, guys, because it's very important, especially if you're doing public assistance. And then in this case, it's really, you know, these is a homeless encampment area. We were basically entombing the rats inside the concrete, uh, like uh, under the elevated areas. Don't forget that you can use concrete to close holes up. It really works well. And then working with Bell Labs and EPA, we're able to get the use of dry ice, which is rat ice. Um, and that's helped a lot, especially because it, you know, really should be addressing the those ectoparasites in addition to the rats. Why is it good? fast, no residual, right? And it's killing those insects. And the way it works, if you're not familiar, is that CO2 is heavier than air. So you're putting the CO2, the dry ice pellets, right at the mouth, and it's basically gonna go to the bottom and fill up, right? You're gonna cap with soil these openings and you're going to kill those rats that are inside. It's not 100%, but it does do pretty well. We've been able to change a lot of areas and knock down the population, some of our parks and some of our commercial areas um, quite well. Think about your trash cans, right? So City of San Francisco, we were looking, I forget what department it was, but they were, were designing new trash cans, right? Um, but they were open. So open trash cans are essentially feeding troughs. I don't care what kind of open trash can, but it's expensive, right, to have those closed cans. I think this is not very clean, of course, but we need to continue to educate people with the roll cards. So when the roll cards were introduced in New Orleans, it really made a huge difference uh, with rodents specifically. And then over the years, these, has, these happen to be big bellies, but you know, rolling more and more out, which is important. So that keeps the trash away from these animals. All right, so we've talked about this already. Um, also, don't forget to use surveys. You can, do, you guys use Microsoft Teams, so you have access to the forms. I put a survey in your chat, right? So it's really easy to try to do surveys of your public to see what they understand. Do they even know you exist, right? A lot of people were finding is like they didn't even know the city had a rodent control program. I'm like I'm on the news all the time, right? So how do we better get our audience uh, involved and engaged? And what we ended up doing, one, I'm not going to show you the whole thing just because of time, is that with our survey of, for tires of our public, we found out that they didn't know that they could put um, waste tires next to their trash cans for pickup. 
right? So we ended up doing, it was, here's the data. They don't know. So let's do an educational campaign with our sanitation department, you know, to get that message out. So those are all things that are important. We're also doing one right now on what people know and what they don't know about rodent control. And this really is our public, right? Um, so that we can use some of these results to better tailor our program, better tailor our education, and hopefully have some better outcomes uh, with that. Anything you do in these programs, you need to have set some goals. I'm just telling you. What are your short term? What are your mid sort of long term goals of what you're trying to do? Um, you know, the leadership has to set these milestone, milestones and move them forward. Um, train your employee with the skill sets of what, what we need, right, to get the job done. And you're going to build that local capacity. If that's in equipment or if that's in training of your staff or if it's education or whatever it may be, right? And look, there isn't enough money to do everything. We're, you know, our budget is not that big. But what we do from our general fund, and but what we do is we look at how to improve efficiency, right? We go find grants. I write grants all the time, right? Spending my time writing grants, right? But I need that extra funding to do these projects. We do product testing. We do a lot of collaborative projects with universities. So those help bring in some additional funding. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up. This is the QR code, right, for that survey that's in your chat. And again, this is part of a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention grant that we have just to get better idea of what people want to see um, so that we can help with that. Um, if you'd like to be on our email list, you can email me directly or you can email us at education at NOLA.gov. We're not going to sell you anything. It's really about um, sending the there's a webinar going on or hey, you know, we have a conference. There's a conference in New Orleans, August 10th, 12th, and uh, August 10th through 12th, and it is real. We have one day dedicated to rodents. Um, you can go online at www.gnopca.com to look at the program, but you can see uh, we have quite the list of speakers. And there's going to be some breakout sessions uh, where you get to get in the field and all of that. But we're updating the agenda. I'll we'll have some a new update here very soon. Actually, this afternoon, because uh, we had a few more uh, vendors coming in. So with that, I think that is all I have. I think I'm used up most of your time, but there might be some questions.